We'll just start. Assassination of John F. Kennedy. Friday, November 22nd, 1963. John F. Kennedy served as president during the height of the Cold War. During his presidency, he saw the increase of military spending on both nuclear and conventional forces and increased the number of U.S. advisors in Vietnam from 400 to 16,000. The Bay of Pigs fiasco, the failure of 1,400 Cuban exiles trained by the CIA to invade their own country, began at the start of his presidency. Then there was the Cuban Missile Crisis, resulting in the USSR and the USA signing the Test Ban Treaty, forbidding nuclear testing in the atmosphere. It also established the hotline, a direct telephone contact between the White House and the Kremlin. During Kennedy's time in office, the Berlin Wall was built by the Soviets in order to stop refugees from fleeing from East Germany to West Germany. In Berlin, he delivered a speech challenging Soviet oppression and gave hope to the people of the city. But in the winter of 1963, the presidency of John F. Kennedy would be tragically cut short. A few months back, we talked about this subject during a Bill Hicks video because Bill was getting into a conspiracy theory surrounding the JFK assassination. And I remember then sharing an opinion that I thought that term conspiracy theory is sometimes almost weaponized in order to stop conversation on certain topics, or at least to get people talking about them to seem tinfoil hatted. Not credible is probably a better way to put that. Or they lump all of the conspiracy theories together. So just let the record reflect. I think the Earth is a sphere. I don't think Elvis is a lizard, for example. I actually don't understand the reptilian one very well, though. But I do know that there were examples in history where something that was considered a conspiracy theory at one time ended up being true. So I guess I'd leave room for that possibility. Just as I leave room for the possibility that I'm wrong. Anyway, after that video, a lot of you in the comment section shared resources and explained to me that the term conspiracy theory was popularized after the JFK assassination, which is an interesting detail that I didn't know. And that one really stuck with me. I don't know how old this video is. Okay. So the video is three years old. The Bill Hicks one was a bit older as well. And that's notable, noteworthy, because last year in 2022, the National Archives dropped what they explained to be as thousands of pages related to the JFK assassination. I personally haven't read any of them, but if you have and you can let us know what happened or what came of that, any findings that they had that were interesting, please do. On November 21st, 1963, President John F. Kennedy and his wife Jacqueline departed on Air Force One for a two-day, five-city tour of Texas. He was to announce his candidacy for the 1964 presidential elections there because Texas was vital for his re-election. Texans needed to be convinced as the state was largely not in favor of Kennedy's civil rights policies and handling of foreign policies like the Bay of Pigs fiasco. The feuding among Democratic Party leaders there also hindered his chances of re-election, and they needed to be brought together. The next morning on November 22nd, Kennedy made a speech to a large crowd outside the hotel that he had stayed in at Fort Worth, and then made another speech inside, at a breakfast hosted by the local Chamber of Commerce. He would say in the last speech he would ever make, This is a very dangerous and uncertain world. We would like to live as we once lived, but history will not permit it. The presidential party left the Texas hotel and went by motorcade to Carswell Air Force Base, boarding Air Force One, and landing at Dallas's Love Field Airport a short time later. President Kennedy and his wife shook hands with an enthusiastic crowd and sat in the back seats of their limousine as part of the motorcade. Democratic Texas Governor John Connolly and his wife were seated in the seats in front of them. In front of these seats were two Secret Service agents. The president's next stop was the Dallas Trade Mart, approximately 10 miles away, where Kennedy was scheduled to deliver another speech. It's estimated that about 200,000 people lined the route to the Trade Mart. The wow. limousine the president was traveling in was an open-top 1961 Lincoln Continental four-door convertible limousine that was called the SS-100X by the Secret Service. The motorcade moved through Dealey Plaza in downtown Dallas, 
Nellie Connolly, the First Lady of Texas, turned around to the president who was sitting behind her and commented, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you, which President Kennedy acknowledged by saying, no, you certainly can't. Those were the last words ever spoken by John F. Kennedy. At 12.30 p.m., the motorcade was passing the grassy knoll to the north of Elm Street and moving towards the Texas School Book Depository. Then gunshots were heard. A bullet hit President Kennedy's neck and hit Governor Connolly's shoulder and wrist. A second shot then hit President Kennedy in the head, covering the limousine's rear interior with fragments of skull, blood, and brain. The impact was so severe that blood and fragments even landed on the Secret Service car that was following behind. I'm trying to think if U.S. presidents still do open-top motorcades. I can't think of one in my lifetime, but maybe that's something I wouldn't be paying attention to. Let me know if you know. I'd kind of think that after Franz Ferdinand and the chain of events that that triggered that we would have stopped then. But on the other side of that, you do hope that people just stop hurting each other, so I get both perspectives. Not a president, but the papa, the, the, papa, the pope also does or did something similar. Uh, I wouldn't call that a motorcade, maybe an open top car public appearance on that pope mobile. But even then, John Paul II was shot. I think the new Papa, why do I keep doing that? <laughs> the new Pope mobiles have the bulletproof shields. Oh, I'm not positive now, I'm gonna have to check. The limousine sped off to Parkland Memorial Hospital within minutes, but it was already too late and doctor's efforts were in vain. Kennedy was declared dead at 1 p.m. Connolly would recover from his wounds. The country and the world was in shock. President Kennedy's body was taken from Parkland Hospital to Love Field and loaded onto Air Force One. At 2.38 p.m., sheltered on board Air Force One in case of further assassination attempts, Lyndon B. Johnson took the oath of office with Jacqueline Kennedy by his side, still wearing her blood-spattered clothes. Can someone tell me, why did Jackie have to be there? The oath was administered by U.S. District Court Judge Sarah Hughes. Less than an hour earlier, a person had been arrested by the police. Witnesses had reported hearing and seeing shots from different directions, but several accounts mentioned the southeast corner window on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository building. Only two employees from the building were missing, one who had walked outside and wasn't allowed back into the building by police at the time of the shooting, and another, Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald, who had only been working there for a month. He had been seen and described by the witnesses who saw him in the sixth floor window, so a description was sent out by the police. As he moved down the floors, he was encountered by Dallas police officer Marion L. Baker, who had his gun drawn. He was allowed to pass, however, because Oswald's supervisor identified him as an employee. Oswald had slipped out of the book depository after the shooting, had walked several blocks, caught a city bus, and then hailed a taxi that took him straight to his boarding house. There, he picked up a pistol and a coat and began to walk out. aimlessly. Oswald had already left the scene on a bus to his boarding house by 12.40 p.m., but the police did discover a rifle underneath some boxes and its shells by the window on the sixth floor, as witnesses had described. The police identified it as a 7.65 Mauser, but later the FBI announced that the police were mistaken and the rifle was an Italian Carcano M91-38 bolt-action rifle. The second-hand Italian-made Carcano rifle had been purchased by Oswald earlier in the year under the alias A. Heidel. The Carcano was a notoriously inaccurate weapon, and for many, it's hard to believe that with such a weapon, Oswald, despite his former military training, could hit a moving target like the president twice with such precision at a range of approximately 250 feet. Shortly afterwards, a Dallas policeman by the name of J.D. Tippett was patrolling his usual area and saw a man who fitted the Oswald description on the corner of 10th Street and Patton Avenue. After a brief exchange of words, Oswald shot Tippett four times with a 38 revolver, killing him in front of witnesses. Oswald ran to the nearby Commercial Street of Jefferson Boulevard. A man named Johnny Calvin Brewer noticed his suspicious behavior and followed Oswald for several blocks to the Texas Theater. Oswald ducked there without buying a ticket. Brewer hailed a police officer, Nick McDonald, who entered the theater accompanied by another officer. 
Both officers apprehended Oswald on the stage of the Texas theater, six blocks away from the scene of the crime at 1.50 p.m. When Oswald was arrested, he was carrying a forged identity card bearing the name Alec J. Heidel, the alias he used to buy the rifle. However, Texas law imposed no control over the purchase of weapons. There was no reason to buy it under an assumed name. So why did Oswald buy the rifle and a handgun by mail order under his assumed name? Curiously, Army Intelligence was known to have a file on A.J. Heidel, the contents of which were destroyed before it could be acquired by investigators. On Sunday morning, November 24th, after being held for two nights, Oswald was being transferred from city jail to the county jail. The event was being broadcast live on TV for millions of Americans to see. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a man shot a pistol point-blank at Oswald, who died two hours later in Parkland Memorial Hospital. The man who fired the pistol was Jack Ruby, a local nightclub owner. He said that he killed Oswald to spare Mrs. Kennedy the discomfiture of coming back to trial. The state funeral for President Kennedy was held on November 25, 1963, with representatives from more than 100 countries and millions of viewers watching it on television. On November 29, 1963, President Lyndon B. Johnson created the President's Commission on the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy, also known as the Warren Commission, after its chairman, Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States. Its 888-page final report was presented to Johnson on September 24, 1964. The Warren Report concluded that Oswald, who had become a skilled marksman as a Marine, had fired three shots, one that entered Kennedy's neck and exited through his throat before hitting Connolly, one that hit Kennedy in the back of the head, the fatal shot, and one that missed the president but ricocheted off a piece of sidewalk which injured James Taig. Many disagreed with these findings and argued instead that there had been a second shooter on the grassy knoll in Dealey Plaza that the motorcade had been approaching, and there were witnesses who thought they had heard shots coming from the direction of a railroad beyond the knoll. The report, however, concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby had acted alone, although the findings of the Warren Commission continue to be controversial. Okay. Oh, what a tough day for Jackie. This was my first time watching this channel. They're called <clears throat> Simple History. I liked the video. I think that they explained it very clearly, easy enough for me to understand. I learned a few things and it left me with some questions. I want to know what happened to Jack Ruby. Does he have life in prison? Did he die there? Was he let out? Why did Jackie have to go to the swearing in of Johnson? I'm curious about that as well. So yeah, things to look into. I'll make sure to link this video for you down below. You can check out the channel, see if there are any more subjects that they cover that interest you. And I have to say, I don't know much about weapons or marksmanship. So I'm one of the last people that should have a strong opinion on that aspect of it. I've seen documentaries of others explaining that they thought the shot would have been nearly impossible for Oswald to make or that there was a second shooter or that he was just a patsy. There are a lot of different theories of what may have happened that day. So I want to know what you think. Leave your thoughts or if you think that the Warren Commission was right in their findings. For a literary recommendation, I'm going to recommend you a book that was recommended to me after the last time we spoke about this subject. And that's one of the only books I've read on the assassination. The rest have been documentaries, but it's called JFK and the Unspeakable. I'm not too sure who the author is. I'm going to find it for you. I'll link it down below. I thought it was a pretty quick read and there were a lot of historical points that they touched on as well that gave some background as to why or possible whys. If you have any books on the subject that you want to share with the channel, please feel free to do that. And yeah, let me know what you think. As always, thank you for watching with me. I'll catch you next time. Bye.